Hello and welcome to the webinar on Pipeline, a Python connector library for any logic. My name is Arash Mahdavi and I will be your host today. In this webinar, Tyler will walk us through Pipeline, an open source library that he has been working on for the past year or so. Tyler Wolf Adam has been a program support specialist at AnyLogic since 2018. His focus has been on providing technical support and helping to advance the AnyLogic AI initiative. He was a co-author of the AnyLogic white paper on AI and simulation and a developer of Pipeline Library. Prior to joining AnyLogic, he received his degree in computer science from DePaul University. I'll come back at the end to answer your questions with Tyler in the live Q&A section. Without further ado, let's start the webinar. Hi everybody. For the first 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be giving a high level overview about what Pipeline is and the motivations you might have for using it. This will serve as an executive summary for those that are just interested in getting a general idea for the library. Our remaining time will be spent discussing more technical and detailed information about the library. This will include installing the library into any logic and how to configure the communicator object, general information about how the communication occurs between your AnyLogic models and the interactive Python environment, the ways to pass data uh, and receive data from the Python environment, optimizing your use of Pipeline through the recommended workflow, a walkthrough of how Python is used in a few of the example models, some of which I'll show in the overview, but this time in more depth. And finally, we'll conclude the, with the Q&A section. Related to that, I'll mention that for the best chance of having your question answered, it's best to ask it before the section starts. Okay, let's start off with a high-level overview. For this, it helps to first define what Pipeline is exactly. If I were to describe it in a single sentence, I'd say that it's a custom library for any logic for connecting to and communicating with a local installation of Python from within a running any logic model. Since this is obviously a very dense sentence, it might help to break it down into its different components. First, the custom library aspect. So with any logic, you could take all the agent types you've created in any, in any given model, whether that's custom blocks or agent types, defined space markups or anything else, and create a new library to package them into. This library can then be exported as a jar file and added directly into your AnyLogic environment. This creates a new tab in your palette with your assets inside of it, allowing them to be used as part of an, any of your future models. One thing you might notice in the screenshot is an icon that resembles the Python logo. And as you might guess, this is the tab for the Pipeline library. It consists of one object called PyCommunicator, and adding this object to your model allows you to set up how the connection to Python is made. Now, when I uh, describe it as connecting to a local installation of Python, what that means is that Pipeline does not in of itself provide any specific version of Python. In fact, it doesn't provide any version at all. Instead, it requires Python to be installed on the user's machine. In the properties of the communicator object, you need to choose the option for how to call your desired version of Python. So this could be either the command you would use if you were in a shell environment, or it could be a directory path that points to the Python executable. I'll also mention that this was an intentional decision. So while it makes the setup slightly more system dependent, it means that Pipeline is compatible with any Python installation. In fact, whether you installed Python from the default installer or other distributions like Anaconda, or if you use virtual environments to manage your libraries, all of these can be accessed from using Pipeline. The last major component of this definition is how the communication actually happens. To send statements from any logic to Python, or to retrieve some values stored in that background Python process, the communicator object comes equipped with some basic functions. In addition, it provides functions to help you convert and parse uh, complex data types. I'll be getting into more details about what these functions are in the technical sections. So now that you have a high level idea about what Pipeline is, it also helps to know why it's useful. And its usefulness ultimately stems from the motivations that you might have to use Python in the first place. Here I've laid out three different uh, example use cases for why you might find Python useful. This certainly doesn't cover every single case, but it should give you a general idea about why it might be useful to use this library. In this first example, you might have an existing Python code base that you want to use from within an any logic model. So this could include scripts for data manipulation, optimizers, or custom algorithms. This is relevant when it's not practical, or sometimes even possible, to re-implement the code in Java. I'll be demoing a small-scale version of this use case in the example models that I show shortly. 
In the second example, you might want to make use of some of the data visualization libraries that Python offers uh, to enhance your AnyLogic models. So to showcase an example of this, let's take a look at one of the pipeline example models, a modified version of the AnyLogic Lorenz weather model. For those of you that aren't familiar with the original Lorenz weather model, I'll briefly describe it. It consists of three interacting system dynamics stocks, which are themselves based on three differential equations, first proposed by Edward Lorenz. And they depict behavior that's chaotic, but deterministic, or without any random elements. The AnyLogic model, as you could see, depicts the relationships between them using three different graphs. Now, as the system con consists of three continuous numbers, an alternative representation of the model could be shown by a 3D plot. For this, the model was modified to use Pipeline. Specifically, the Python library named matplotlib is used to show a live 3D plot. So when running the AnyLogic model, Python is connected to, and a window pops up next to the model window that shows a live interactive 3D plot. So as you could see, I could pan around the 3D window to see it from different angles. And the fact that it's synchronized means that I can change any of the values within any logic, and the plot itself will also update. One other thing that this example shows is Pipeline's natural ability to work in parallel with itself. For example, if I run a parameters variation experiment that runs four different simulation models in parallel, it will then pop up with four different uh, model windows that I can drag around here, and you could see all four running at once. And so each one of these is operating independently of one another with different parameters, as you could see from the different titles. A third example use case involves being able to get predictions from machine learning models that you've trained within Python. To see an implementation of this, let's take a look at the pipeline example model of a simple hospital. For this example, I trained two different deep learning policies in Python using real-world data sources for two different purposes. The first policy predicts the arrival rate of patients to a hospital based on the previous day's worth of arrival rates. This update happens every four hours. When a given patient comes into the model, they have 24 attributes that describe the current condition of their health. The second policy takes these attributes and predicts their length of stay. This example serves to both demonstrate the two policies in action, but also to test them in relation to another metric, like hospital capacity. As you can see from the model resources, but also if I open up the model folder, both of these policies are saved as H5 formats and located within the model directory. There's also a Python file which handles importing the TensorFlow library, loading the policies, and running the predictions for each of the policies that are called. I'll go into more about the local Python files and how they're used in relation to Pipeline in the following technical sections. Once running the model, you could see that the process involved is rather simple, consisting of only four discrete event blocks. There's two places where the predictions are called. The Python functions I talked about before are both located in the, the cyclical event, which updates the arrival rates in the source block, and also the delay block to get the length of stay. On the right, you can see that there's three different graphs depicting the current state of the system. This top one shows how the arrival rates are fluctuating over time. The middle one shows a distribution of stay durations, and the third one shows how many beds are in use versus how many people are queuing for a bed. If I advance the model to a quicker speed, you'll see that the amount of people that are waiting in bed uh, varies over time, and it's slowly accumulating. There's an additional slider here that allows you to dynamically adjust how many beds are available. So in this case, I set it to 310. And from this, you can experiment with finding the optimal number of beds uh, such that the queue size always remains uh, below a certain limit. One interesting uh, other contrast that I wanted to point out between the two examples that I showed uh, that is between the Lorenz weather and the hospital examples, is that the purpose for using pipeline in relation to the simulation model is different. So with the modified Lorenz example, the purpose of using pipeline was to enhance an already existing simulation model. In contrast, the purpose of using pipeline for the hospital example was to create a simulation model around some existing Python assets.
this just shows two different motivations you might have for using Pipeline beyond what Python libraries are used. To conclude the overview, I just wanted to make a few important remarks. Most importantly, I want to mention a big caveat that in the current version of AnyLogic, Python is not meant to be a replacement for Java, which is the natural language of AnyLogic models. It will almost always be more optimal to use Java or Java libraries. This is true for Pipeline and any other similar library as well, as there's some natural overhead that's required to convert from Java to Python. This might not be noticeable in smaller models, but it might be something to be aware of when you're running high-performance models. Another remark, which I won't be getting into any level of detail here, is that you cannot use Pipeline to train reinforcement learning agents. So, in other words, if you're looking to use simulation as the training environment for RL, you cannot use Pipeline. If you're looking for this, we have partnerships with Pathmine and Microsoft Project Banzai to help automate reinforcement learning. We'll also soon have an update to the AnyLogic Cloud, which will have an interruptible API, allowing for RL training. And as a completely offline alternative, I'm currently working on another library, tentatively named Alpine, which will allow you to use your simulation models in this way. Lastly, Pipeline is available open source on GitHub. In addition to being able to download the library, example models, and seeing the source code, which is itself an any logic model, you can also file any suggestions or issues that you have. All right, next I'll demonstrate the installation and configuration process. Note that I'll be going through these steps faster than what you could do live. The goal here is for you to just observe the steps involved. Later, when this video is uploaded to YouTube, you could feel free to walk through the process at your own pace. To start, I'll first download the pipeline jar file by navigating to the GitHub page with the short URL git.io slash al underscore pi. In the center of this page, you'll see a list of files and a short description of the library. If you want to file suggestions or bugs and you have a GitHub account, you could do so from the Issues tab and then clicking on New Issues at the top right. Back on the main code tab, you'll see a Releases section on the right. Clicking on it will show the list of releases in reverse chronological order, with the most recent at the top. To download the jar, you just need to click on the file under Assets. The latest examples and project source could also be downloaded here as well. Note that if it prompts you to with any security questions, just go ahead and press Keep. So this next step in the process is crucially important you should move the downloaded JAR file to a location on your hard drive where it won't later be moved or accidentally deleted. For myself, I have a special folder in my models directory, specifically for libraries I add to AnyLogic. Now to that added to your AnyLogic environment, navigate to the software, then to the palette view, and then in the bottom left, click on the plus button. From the context menu that pops up, select Manage Libraries. In the pop-up, this shows you the list of your installed libraries. To add a new one, click the Add button, then find the pipeline jar file in the directory that you placed it in. Go ahead and click on it and then press the OK button. And then you should verify that it's listed in the list of libraries. Once you've done that, go ahead and click OK. You should now have a new tab in your palette view for pipeline. And in general, this is how you add other AnyLogic libraries to your environment. Now, to talk about configuration, I'll create a new model and drag in the Pi Communicator object. With the object selected, you can see the available properties. The primary option that we'll focus on right now is Command to Call Python. This is what you configure so that Pipeline knows which installation of Python to use. What the option is referring to is what you would type to enter an interactive Python environment if you were to call it from a command prompt. To see what I mean, let me open up a new command prompt and see what version of Python is installed on my machine for the default command shown in the properties, which is just the Python command. And here you can see that it points to Python 3.6.6. If I now go back and try running the model with this setting, and then click on the Py Communicator object, I can see that it is indeed using Python 3.6.6. Okay, but what about the other one? the other command for Python 3. Well, if I go to my command prompt and try to run the Python 3 command to check the version, you could see that there's an error. This means that there's no version of Python that corresponds to the Python 3 command. Let me go ahead anyway and try running the model with that option chosen just to display what happens. When I do that, it looks like the model threw an error. 
Looking at the description for this error, you could see that it couldn't find anything associated with the Python 3 command, as we would expect. However, wait a second, I know that I have Python 3.7 installed as well, and I believe it's tied to the Python 3.7 command? Yeah, that was it. Fortunately, the PyCommunicator object also has an other field, which allows you to enter in an other alias as a Java string. If we enter that into the new Python command field, and then go ahead and rerun the model, you can see that there's not only no errors, but if you click on the PyCommunicator object, you could see that it indeed found the correct version of Python 3.7. So calling Python this way through the commands is possible because the Python executables live in a directory that's on my system path. And if you want to use pipeline in this way, but don't have Python on your system path, there's plenty of tutorials out there to show you how to do that based on your operating system. However, if you don't want to do this, or can't for whatever reason, for example security reasons, there's another option available. If you choose the option for path, you can enter in the full path to your Python executable. This also works for virtual environments as well. For example, I also have a third Python environment installed through Anaconda, which is on another hard drive. So I'll just copy the directory path that the Python executable sits in and paste it in a string into this Python executable path field, and then try to run the model. But when I try to do that, it looks like I got an error. Now, what this is pointing to is the fact that the backslash is a special character in many languages, including Java, and because Windows uses it as part of its directory path, you need to escape it by adding yet another backslash. And once I do that and try to run it again, you could see that it successfully connects to Python 3.8, referencing that version of Anaconda that's on my D drive. Next, the two options below the command option concern how pipeline works while your model is running. For the first one, throw error on failed attempt, what this means is that if it's checked and there's an error inside of Python, it will ripple that error into your AnyLogic model. For example, if I tell Python to execute the code 1 divided by 0, you'll see that it throws a 0 division error when I try to run the model which ultimately stems from the PyCommunicator object. In contrast, if I disable the option and try running the model, no errors. The command still failed to execute though, and you can check that by printing out the output. I'll talk about all of this shortly in the next section. The last listed option concerns what happens when print or warning statements are executed in Python. With this option checked, either of these types of statements will be redirected to your AnyLogic model, specifically to the console. For example, if I tell Python to execute a print statement and a warning, and then also have AnyLogic print something out, and then I try to run the model, you could see that the two Python statements get printed out, prefixed by a greater than symbol, with the print statement in green and the warning in red. Going back to the communicator's properties, you may have noticed that I skipped the first option, the one regarding loading from a working configuration. One feature about Pipeline is that whenever you successfully launch a model using the communicator object, the properties that you've set are saved in a file next to the library's jar file. Why this is useful is to reduce the amount of locating the correct paths that you need to do in configuring each Py communicator object how you'd like. So, for example, if I were to create a new model, I could drag in a new PyCommunicator object, and instead of having to relocate that path again and set up the settings how I like it, I could simply check that box, and then it will use the last run's settings. As you could see here, instead of the default 3, Python 3.6 that I showed at the very start, this is now loading using that Anaconda version of Python. All right, now that I've gone through the installation and configuration process, let me take a step back and talk about how Pipeline communicates with Python. In general, you can execute Python code via a script or interactively. Now, when I say running via script, what I'm referring to is the traditional way of executing code, where the entirety of your logic is contained within a file, which you later call from some external source, like the command line. Once you call a script, it might return some output, which it'll print to the standard output. Afterwards, the script finishes running, and the Python session is terminated. 
On the other hand, with Interactive Python, a live environment is created and waits in the background for you to enter some code. In this environment, you could do essentially anything that you can do in a script, like create, update, or retrieve variable values, import libraries, etc. But everything is dynamically evaluated as it's submitted. Unlike when running via a script, this interactive session is only terminated when you exit out of the environment, either through a command or just closing out of the, the window that it's in. So running Python files like scripts is possible using Pipeline, but the primary focus here is on interactive Python. With interactive execution, there's two methods of communication that Pipeline provides. The first is for uni or one-directional statements. This is used to send data to Python with no expected return. It's used for things like import statements, variable assignments, or updates. This type of execution is called via the run function. The second is for by or two-directional statements. This is used to again send some data to Python, but it has some ex expected return value. It's used when you want to get variable values and evaluate expressions. This type of execution is called via the run results function. Both of these functions take a string as input, representing the Python code that you want to execute. Another shared behavior of both is that, for the most part, they return a custom object type called attempt. The attempt object has two components to it. One to indicate whether the Python command evaluated successfully. The second retrieves the output from the command, if there was any. If there is an error in executing the command, and in other words, if the isSuccessful function returns false, the getFeedback function will contain that error message. This is primarily useful when you disable the property for throwing a model error if the Python command fails. Assuming there were no errors, the getFeedback function will instead return nothing when called from the run function, and the command's output when called from the run results function. I'll get into more details about this in the next section. First though, let's take a look at another pipeline model, this one a simple demo that visually shows you how these commands work. In the set of Pipeline's example models, there are a few demos which showcase a few uh, parts about the library that are simplified versions of the more complex examples. So this specific one is to show off the two different basic functions that Pipeline offers. When you first run it, you're greeted with a uh, simple description on the experiment screen. If you go ahead and run it, you can then see that on the left here there's two sections. One are a series of fields which have uh, statements that are associated with the run function. And on the bottom is a field for the statement type that's associated with the run results field, or function rather. In the middle here, you have the Pi communicator object inside of a cloud, which just represents the background Python process that's happening. And on the right here, what you'll see is uh, some history of code and the results of the attempt. And so one thing that I hadn't mentioned yet is that the Pi communicator object comes equipped with a history collection in which it keeps track of your previous commands. So to show an example of this, let's run a few statements. So let's import the random library and then set a new variable in Python called x and assign it to a random number between 1 and 10. So if you go ahead and press the run button, what you'll see is that it calls the run function of the Pi communicator object, passing in the code that you want to execute within a string. In addition, on the right here, you could see that there's the two lines of code that were run, and both of them were successful. Because this is a run function and it ran successfully, there's no feedback. So that was sent to Python, and that's the end of the statement. So now, this variable x lives in the, in the live interactive Python environment that's operating in the background. And if we want to get that value, we can see the value is by calling run results, calling x inside of a quoted string. And that returns back 7. And so you can maybe want to update the variable by doing plus equals 3. And so now we would expect that the feedback for x now would be 10. 
and you could see here that it is indeed 10. So this model serves as a good one to play around with uh, different imports or other statements in addition to setting or assigning variables to see what um, the values you get. Now I can also execute statements that will uh, return false values. For example, if I do 1 divided by 0 again, here you could see that it uh, was not successful with the feedback zero division error. You'll also observe that the model is still running and that unsuccessful command didn't halt the model. If I go back to the uh, AnyLogic environment and click on the Pi Communicator object, you could see that the option for throw error on failed attempt was disabled. And that's why the model is still able to run, even though we encountered an error. So this just kind of shows you a, a high level uh, overview about what the these commands can do. Now, something that I previously glossed over is how you indicate return types when receiving data from Python. So in this section, I'm going to talk about passing and receiving data types. As many of you might know, typically when programming in Python, you don't need to specify data types. So assigning a variable to some quoted text will just be inferred as a string. Since Java requires data types to be known though, the process for sending and receiving data with pipeline is slightly different from one another. When sending data types to Python, you only need to ensure that the syntax is correct. That is, for example, for strings, that it has both an open and close quotation mark. If you're assigning a floating point number, you just assign that variable to that number. On the other hand, because Java is a statically typed language, you need to specify the data type when you're wanting to get values back from Python. As you might remember from the previous section, the run results function returns an attempt object whose feedback will be the output. If you call that feedback function without any arguments, it will return that value as a string. But you can also pass the class as an argument, and it will convert the object to the given data type. This is shown in the two examples shown on screen, where the first one is getting the value of 8 back as a string, whereas the second one is getting the value of 8 back as a integer. Specifically for run results, there's a shortcut in the latest version of Pipeline that allows you to pass the class type as the first argument to run results, and it will just immediately return the converted object type, which is the example that you see in the box. So far, I've talked about simple data types, but of course, your AnyLogic models and potential Python scripts will have many more complicated structures. For this, Pipeline uses a syntax format that both Java and Python can parse, which is called JSON. If, for those that don't know, JSON is a lightweight data interchange format that's both easy for humans and machines to comprehend. I won't get into the details of JSON other than to mention a few of the basic attributes of it. First, it supports basic types like strings, numbers, and booleans. Second, you can structure data uh, in two different ways. One is in a list-like format that uses square brackets. Another way is you can also have a map or a dictionary collection which pairs a string key to a value of any type, including any of the uh, list or map collection that I've described. Why this is so useful is that you can then create nested data structures in this way and convert pretty much any type of object that you might have to this format. So any part of your AnyLogic model from a simple collection to a nested population of custom agents can be converted to a JSON format. Although AnyLogic already comes equipped with Jackson, which is a library in Java that's capable of processing JSON, uh, Pipeline offers four different JSON-related functions to kind of abstract away and make this easier to, to work with. The first and simplest of these four functions is called toJSON. It takes any object and converts it to JSON format. It also has a second argument, which if you pass true to it, will output the JSON using new lines and tabs, also known as pretty printing. It's important to note that when you're passing uh, any 
any logic related type, whether that's an agent or a population, that I wrote the function to filter out object types which were problematic in converting or that I deemed to be unnecessary. So this mostly includes space markups, shapes, controls, and blocks, but everything else is included. Of course, what's nice about this library being open source is that you're also free to download the source code, which again is just an AnyLogic model, and change this to your liking. For an interesting, more comprehensive example, here is the pretty printed output for a manufacturing center agent type from AnyLogic's product delivery model. As you could see, what was output included the agent parameters, system dynamic stock value, the internal data sets for both the rate and the stock, and for agents in a population, an extra mapping to indicate the agent's index. In contrast, you'll notice that the agent links, the animation, the slider, and the blocks were all excluded from this JSON string. As you'll see later, other parts of agents are captured as well, such as collections and variables, nested agents, and other analysis objects. The three other JSON functions deal with converting from JSON strings to Java objects. The from JSON function is the most basic and works similar to the arguments to run results. It converts any JSON string to the given Java class, so this is most relevant to things like array lists or other types of Java collections. For the last two, because any logic agents and populations have a lot of hidden complexities, these functions specifically are for converting JSON strings to individual agents or whole populations. The from agent JSON function takes a mapping of parameter names to values along with the agent class and returns that agent type. Currently though, it only supports parameter types that are a Java primitive or any of the uh, types that JSON supports. So uh, you could use it with strings, numbers, and booleans, but it couldn't say use it with an agent type that used another agent type as one of its parameter inputs. Since the manufacturing center agent type shown previously only uses ints and doubles, the example here shows an example of this function in action. So the capacity and products and storage are both double values, and the end vehicles parameter is an integer. And so because of this, the JSON string can have the, the names of each of these parameters, and it's mapped to the desired values. Then using the from agent JSON, passing the JSON string in the manufacturing center class, it can then convert that object to a live uh, any logic agent. One day I hope to implement more complex parameter values or figure out some way to um, handle any agent type that you might be able to pass to it through JSON. But again, the nice part about Pipeline being an open source library is that you can always fork the library and propose a change for how to implement this. The last of the four functions is from population JSON. It works pretty much exactly like from agent JSON, except it expects a list where each entry in that list is a dictionary representing one agent's mapping. Optionally, you can also provide a, an existing AnyLogic population, and it will add those new agents to that specific population. Hopefully that was able to give a generally good overview about the types of data that you can pass and receive to and from Python. The examples that we'll look into shortly will kind of utilize some of these concepts as well. Now, in order to optimize your usage of the library, I've put together a few suggestions regarding the general workflow. The first recommendation is definitely the most significant one, that is, to take advantage of Python's ability to perform local imports. With Python, there are three general categories of imports. The first is from the standard library, which are modules that come installed with Python. These are things like math, random, etc. The second category would be third-party libraries, which are installed through some package manager, like Anaconda or PIP. These first two are installed on your hard drive and can be imported from a Python file located anywhere else. In contrast, the third group is for local files. When you launch Python in a given working directory, you can import Python files in that same directory by referencing their file name but without the extension. 
In the example shown here, running the main.py file imports from data, which you can see circled in green. This reference to data isn't from the standard library or a third-party one. Rather, it's the data.py file that's located in the same directory as main.py. A similar concept applies with pipeline when you launch from an AnyLogic model. You can import Python files located in the same directory as your model source file, or the model's ALP file. Pretty much all the examples I've made import from a local Python file, which contain the bulk of the Python code. Arranging the solutions this way has a few major benefits. For one, I'm minimizing the amount of Python code that's written inside Java strings. As you would expect, this is not only more efficient, as less strings need to be parsed, but it's also less prone to syntax errors. The other major benefit to this approach is that I can test these files separately from my AnyLogic model and verify that they're working as intended before I put them into use. For example, in the plotter.py file used in the modified Lorenz weather example, there's some code that calls each function I use in the AnyLogic model and also measures how quickly it can update itself with randomly plotted points. As you can imagine, this would be much more tedious if I tried to run this all through strings inside of AnyLogic. A second workflow tip is regarding situations when you do need to run some Python code inside of AnyLogic. When calling run or run results, you can actually pass multiple strings as arguments. Doing so is interpreted as multiple lines of code. This is useful for minimizing the amount of times you have to call the run or run results function. Having seen the previous tip, it should be clear why you might want to minimize the amount of Python code this way. With no ability to have a code completion, and with Python sensitivity to tab size consistency, it's best reserved for specific use cases, like executing multiple import statements at once. The last workflow tip concerns calling Python code that has to alternate between needing Java input and Python syntax. For example, let's say that you want to call a Python function that takes multiple arguments requiring uh, Java variables between them. To inject any logic values for those arguments, you would need to concatenate strings with any logic variables. This can quickly get confusing and it's easy to make mistakes. Fortunately, Java has a function called string.format. It works by passing a string as the first argument that has different format placeholders based on the data types that you want to add. As arguments after the string, you specify what you want to replace those placeholders with. I won't get into the details of this function or the different types of placeholders you can use, but for this purpose you could just use the percent sign %s placeholder for everything. You could see in the example shown here that you could type the complete string entering the placeholders where you want the subsequent variables to be replaced. When this line of code is executed, the three percent sign %s's will be replaced with the values of x, y, and z. So hopefully with these workflow tips, you're able to make optimal use out of Pipeline. And now, before diving into the Q&A, let me go through some of Pipeline's example models. Hopefully based on everything that I've shown today, uh, it will be easier to understand what's going on in these models. Starting off, let's go back to the start and take a look at the modified Lorenz weather model. Because the Python code is being used to supplement the model, let's take a look at that first. You could see at the start of the script that I have the library imports that happen whenever this file is executed directly or imported. In this case, you'll need the matplotlib library installed in order to run this example. And the collections library that you see there is part of Python's standard modules. After creating the figure, three collections are initialized, set to the same size limit as in the AnyLogic model. Further variables for the plot itself are created and added to the figure. This is all standard use of the matplotlib library. In the middle is three functions that will call from within any logic. The first two are for setup purposes, with set inputs modifying the plot's title based on the past inputs from the AnyLogic model. This is primarily used and really useful for the parameters variation experiment, as we otherwise don't know which 3D plot represents which set of parameters. The second function, moveFigure, just moves the plot's window to a point on the screen. This is mostly just a convenience to avoid having to manually do this every time we run the model. And the third function is the most important. It adds, or 
appends, uh, the given XYZ point to the data sets and also refreshes the figure. Lastly, there's the test code I showed earlier. What you might notice is that it's inside a conditional block, which will only execute if name equals main. Um, in case you're not familiar with these special variable names, what the condition is essentially asking is whether the entry point for this Python script is this specific file. So when I run the script directly, the entry point is indeed the script, so the code will run. But in contrast, if I import this file using pipeline, or actually if I were to import this file from any other Python file, the entry point for Python would not be this script, and thus this code would not execute. Essentially, what this enables us to do is to write test code that only executes if we run this file directly. If I go back to the AnyLogic environment, you could see that when this model starts up, it imports the plotter file, and then it updates the title by calling that setInputs function, and then it moves the figure to approximately right of where the model window will pop up. In your own setup, you could feel free to change this xy coordinate to another position, or even just comment the line out entirely, in case your screen setup is different. The next thing to look at is this update pyplot event. As you can see, it's a cyclical event, and actually its recurrence time is set to a parameter. In this case, plot update recurrence underscore hours. This is needed to be dynamic because through the testing, it was found that matplotlib can only update about 30 times a second, much slower than the AnyLogic model can run at. The default time is configured to uh, cause the events to trigger every 0.75 hours or 45 minutes of simulated time because that's what works at the times one speed. Because Pipeline synchronizes AnyLogic's execution with Python's, trying to run at faster speeds with the default recurrence time won't actually advance the model any faster. As somewhat of a fix, you can have the plot go longer between updates using the slider. I figured out some approximate measurements and have the warning pop up based on what the model is trying to run at versus how long the time is set between the updates. Looking back at the update event, you could see that the action for this calls the append function of the imported plotter library, or rather the plotter file. You could also see that it's wrapped in a try-catch block. This is in addition by Nikolai, who recognized that when you close the matplotlib window, that'll cause an error, which will uh, ripple out to any logic, as I showed earlier. To resolve this, he contributed to the example model by having the any logic model close if the situation comes up, as it's assumed that closing the matplotlib window should also close the, the simulation. One thing I'll note about that is anybody can feel free to uh, fork the project and then later submit uh, a pull request after you've made some improvements if you um, think that some changes that you make are uh, worthy of contributing to the, the project. Lastly, you can see that there's a Save Fig button. Clicking on this will save an image of the current view of the plot with the file name based on the current model time to your model folder. Here you can see the placeholder I use in the string.format call is such that it'll round the time to two decimal places. One other interesting th thing to look at is the parameters variation experiment. If I scroll down and look through these properties, you could see that there's nothing special that's required to set this up. Each of the four variations will launch another simulation model and thus its own instance of pipeline. This is what allows them to work simultaneously and in parallel. Wrapping up, let's take a deeper dive on the hospital model that we started to look at earlier. As you could see in the on startup code, there's a chained statement in which it imports from a local file called nn model parser, importing the, this object and then instantiating it in a, in a new variable. So let's go ahead and take a look at that file to see what is going on inside of it. As with before, with the previous example that we saw, the first part of the, the script is importing the third-party libraries, in addition to importing a double-ended queue from the built-in collections. Then it creates this class, which is used to query the neural networks from inside any logic, and it instantiates uh, both of the models by loading them from the local files. 
because the rate uh, arrival rate model is based on the previous six days, we need to randomly generate some values just for it to, to start with. There's then two functions inside of this object. The first one is predict LOS, or length of stay. This takes that 1 by 24 array of patient data, it predicts the value, and then it outputs it. For the arrival rate, it uses the last six values, as I stated before, or one day's worth, to predict the next four hours worth of data. So to do this, it uh, takes that queue that it had created at the start up here, it reshapes it to get it to the proper format, it predicts it, and then it uh, gets the value and scales it back to the original ranges, returning that unscaled value. So with that, we have two functions which we can easily call the uh, get the, the next data point from. Especially for the predict rate function, there's nothing that needs to be passed. This object within Python keeps track of the last day's worth of data on its own. Going back to the AnyLogic model, it should be pretty straightforward based on what we've seen so far to figure out what's going on here. In this update arrival rate, every four hours, like I had stated, it's calling that predict rate function, which again handles all of the previous data in addition to adding it to that queue collection inside of Python on its own. It's returning a double value, and then it's just setting that new rate per hour. The length of stay is a little bit different. When agents come into this block, it calls run results on that predict length of stay, calling this function called get array string. So if you look inside the agent type, the patient, you could see that there's the various different values that are associated with each patient. And in addition, there's this get array string. So in the case of uh, this neural network that's being processed, it requires the data be in a very specific order, which is the order listed here. Actually, if you look at previous versions of this model, uh, which you could do from the, the GitHub, I actually had previously an implementation which just added the, um, it concatenated the strings and commas together as opposed to doing the placeholder method. And it was uh, much more cumbersome to write. In fact, I there's a kind of a shortcut here in which instead of having to write percent sign s comma 24 times, uh, the strings library has a repeat function which allows you to uh, kind of just pass in the value and then it will repeat that for you. So that's what this placeholder string is doing. It's just the 24 placeholders. So then it uses string.format for the placeholders, passing all those values. You might notice that it's in this double bracket array. That's just what uh, the format that Python needs it in. And then it's able to be passed to Python through that um, the function that's called from within the delay block. So beyond that, everything else is just a standard any logic model. And now, to wrap us up, Arash and I are going to come to you live to answer a few of your questions. Thank you so much, Tyler, for the uh, great webinar. And uh, thank you um, for joining us uh, and kind of staying with us till the end. I have a kind of long list of questions. Some of them have been answered by Tyler in the chat. But um, I kind of paraphrasing the questions and I summarized most of them into a list of questions that will be beneficial for um, the audience as a whole. So without um, uh, further ado, let's jump into the questions. Uh, the first one, with pipeline, is it possible to write the entirety of my Python code inside any logic? Okay, so you know I'm I'm kind of know the answer to this, so I'm going to answer it in my own words, and uh, in the follow up, uh, Tyler can uh, elaborate more on the the answer. So um, yeah, you can do it technically. So uh, Pipeline is capable of just parsing multi line commands, but um, it if you look into the uh, workflow that Tyler showed, 
there are better ways to do it. So we prefer you to delegate majority of like the work into Python files. So Tyler, let's see if we can hear you now. I can see you, but I'm not sure if I can hear you. Can you, you hear me? Yes, perfect. Oh, oh good. Okay. Very good. So do you want to add to my answer to the first question? Um, I was a little bit distracted, but um, I think you generally answered it. So yes, you could write the entirety of the code. Um, as I stated at one point, you can write multi-lined Python code. The important thing being that because Python is uh, tab consistent or it's sensitive rather, um, but as long as you use the same amount of space or tabs um, in a multi-lined command, it, it, um, you, could, you could do that. So technically, yes, you could write um, you know, entire classes using pipeline. Okay. But it's not really practical. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the second question: What is the benefit of using JSON format? So I saw that you actually had a like a kind of extensive section about JSON. So can yes. you elaborate a little bit more about why you think it's important to use? Mm -hmm. Yep. So JSON is used as a unified format between Java and Python to pass complex data structures. So both of them uh, define structures like lists and uh, maps in addition to things like booleans in two different ways. So rather than having mechanisms to uh, convert these things, uh, JSON just kind of serves as a, as a nice way of, of doing that. Plus it's also much easier to read. And in fact, one thing that I wasn't able to really get into is that I'm, let's see, can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Um, one thing I didn't get into is with the most recent version of Pipeline, there are there's currently a new demo which showcases how you could use JSON in a, in a few different ways, um, both from loading from a local JSON file, uh, which I have in this function here, and it has a local JSON file which is used as input to the model, um, but also it's used for uh, periodic saving of the data structures of the model, and also um, for offloading some of the, like passing the uh, companies in this case, the population, passing that to Python to process with JSON. And so from this, some of the, the, the logic is offset to Python, which is uses the, the data um, uh, with JSON. So here we have a, a JSON uh, format, which is, what describes all of these three companies that were used. So, um, and I'm currently working on a more practical, fully fledged JSON example, which should be available soonish. Okay, perfect. Uh, the next one, and there are many questions. I, I'm kind of summarize them in this one about uh, why I cannot use pipeline for enforcement learning. Yes. So, and I that was something that came up a lot, which was can I use Python to control in any logic model? Um, and the distinction is a bit abstract, so I'm gonna have in the follow-up materials a more uh, thorough um, explanation about why this is impossible. But in short, if you think about a traditional Python setup for RL, you have Python, which is used as the execution environment. And then within that, you have your learning agent and your simulated environment, which could be um, uh, like a carpool example, let's say. So with this, the RL agent can set and reset the carpool environment, let's say, and play around with it. And when it resets the environment, nothing else is impacted because uh, the larger execution environment is Python. But with pipeline, what you're doing is you're launching Python from your simulation environment. And so because of that, if you if an RL agent wanted to uh, reset the simulation model, it would end up closing down Python with that learning agent inside of it. So it would ultimately destroy the progress and you could only, it only be effective for one episode, essentially. So that's kind of a, a, an abbreviated version about why you couldn't use um, uh, okay. this for, for RL. And I, I, this is my own question. So I, I've heard that you talked about Alpine. Do you want to give us a short like a description of how how you're going to solve that side of the equation without right right so alpine is kind of like a 
um, it's the, the roles are reversed. So instead of pipeline, we're the main execution environment where the parent environment is any logic here your main environment is python and so what alpine does is you would export in any logic model and then using alpine which is going to be a python library it will let you point to that uh, that exported any logic model and then start it up like you would any other gym environment or anything else like that so you could create your own experiments and including using RL for that. Okay, great. Uh, this, the next question, can I use pipeline with any logic cloud? Uh -huh. Well, so the answer is no. Um, because Python, or sorry, because pipeline relies on a version of Python that's installed on the machine the model is running on, and the any logic cloud doesn't support access to that or might not even have Python installed on it. And so that also applies to any cloud environment in general. So you could use it in a cloud environment if that cloud had Python installed on it and it was configured in a way where you could access the executable. Okay, perfect. Uh, does pipeline work with PyTorch, TensorFlow, or Pandas? Mm -hmm. Yep, so for the RL related libraries like uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, you could you, you could call those libraries and import them using pipeline if you wanted to uh, test trained machine learning or reinforcement learning models, as I showed with the hospital example. For pandas, you could also definitely use that. So you could pass data to that and get data from pandas. Um, kind of best way to do that would be using a, the JSON format to convert from whatever uh, pandas exports to a format that then Java will understand. So okay. yeah, you can. Okay, perfect. Um, is there any documentation or reference guide for a pipeline? Yes, so if I actually share again. So on the, the GitHub page, there is, in addition to a general readme, which has kind of a short overview guide, um, there's actually a, a more fully fledged user guide, which is in a PDF form. And so you could view it from here inside GitHub, and it has everything like a lot of what I've talked about in the webinar, um, in addition to being able to download it as well. And then you can also, um, you know, some of the kind of basic functionalities are available from the uh, demo models as well. So if you download the examples, you can look around those and those are more uh, kind of hands-on ways that you can kind of learn about the different features. Okay, so now that you are showing the repo, so I had another question, it's kind of like a related to this. Is it possible to provide the source code for the pipeline.jar file as well? Yes, so with the, the releases section, there's also the source code zip file, which you can download. And when you do that, I'm not sure if it will download reasonable time, but it will, actually if I go back to the main code, so this is the, the file viewer. So if I go into source and then pipeline library, you could see that the source is actually just an ALP file. So you could open it up inside of any logic and peek into what the model uh, looks like, what that communicator object looks like inside. Okay, and the last question, can pipeline be used with the free version of any logic or the PLE, let's say? Yep, or so fortunately, Mm -hmm. with with ple you could add custom libraries just like you could in uh, any other edition of any logic so yeah so there's, there's no difference between that and that so all the researchers and students can use it for their kind of educational purposes as well mm -hmm. Absolutely. okay thank you so much tyler um before going, I wanted to thank uh, Nikolai Cherkov for his support and insightful suggestions during the development of the library. And obviously, I want to thank Tyler for all the hard work that um, you put into the development of Pipeline. And I know that you're working on the next library pretty soon will be released as well. Thank you so much for the webinar. I think uh, it was fast paced and dense with information. And as you know, we are going to provide a recording of the webinar. Please uh, uh, go back and rewatch uh, some of the uh, maybe more complex concepts that Tyler mentioned. 
And I have to say from my personal experience with the library, I've been using it in the past few months. I think it really opens up a wide range of possibilities uh, to any logic users. Um, and, uh, but again, from my experience, I recommend you to follow Tyler's recommended workflow. Um, and if you, Tyler showed it during the webinar, if you prefer written instructions, please go to the user guide that Tyler just showed you in the GitHub repo and um, try to follow the recommended workflow. It, it definitely makes life a, a lot easier and uh, you will see the benefit of the pipeline um, in a way that it was intended to be used. Um, lastly, you'll receive a short survey right after the webinar. Uh, your feedback is highly valued and immensely important in letting us know your thoughts about today's webinar and future ones as well. Um, again, thank you, Tyler, for, for everything you've done for this library, and thank you uh, for your time today with us. Uh, be safe and have a great rest of your week. Thank, thank you. you.